but on 9-11, um, I was stranded in Detroit, and she was, uh, she was a minister at the church there, at the Mile High Church, and um, we spent the whole evening together, thousands of people. I was stranded in Detroit, and then you know, I was on a book tour, and actually then I canceled my book tour, and I drove uh, from city to city, um, all towards the West Coast, doing what we had done that evening together. And of course, well, that you remember, putting out a full-page ad in the New York Times. Uh, and th since then, now, you know what, it's so many years, if anything, um, things seem even more turbulent. We're living in very turbulent times. Uh, I, uh, people ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist, and I am neither. I'm a realist. And I think we're in, in a very crucial point in our history as a human species. But I'll come to that later. Um, Marianne and I have um, a very good, very good personal relationship. We may not be on the same frequency sometimes, uh, how we see things, but that's why we get along so well. And I love you a lot, as you know. And she loves me too. So <laughs> tonight, what we're going to do is let Marianne start the evening's conversation um, because we are introducing a new movement, I think, here tonight, um, in a way. And uh, the whole world is watching on Facebook Live, on Facebook Mentions, my Facebook, which gets almost two million people. So hi, everyone. Marianne, please say hi to everyone. So, and this will be on YouTube as well. Um, so we're starting in a way a new movement. And um, right now the word is integrative politics. So let's start with Marianne, where your mind is right now uh, after the election and uh, where do you want to take us as in our, you know, in the journey of a mind first, and then how do we execute? Okay, so let's start with that. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. I love you too. <laughs> thank you. It is an honor to be here. Thank you, Deepak, and thank you, the wonderful Paulette Cole. And I'm always excited to be in the presence of Robert Thurman too, so what a wonderful oh, night. Oh, Bob. And to all of you, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And uh, I don't think of myself as wanting to take you anywhere, uh, but I am honored and compelled, as you are, uh, to be part of a deep inquiry that I think is happening inside minds and hearts really all over this country and all over this world. So I'm happy to uh, be able to speak into that listening and to that reflection and consideration. And um, thank you for having me. Let's take a moment, let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. In this moment, we consciously and willingly surrender all distraction and meaningless preoccupation. We allow ourselves to remember the light that is the truth and beauty and love that is our core and our source. It is to that divinity, it is to that holiness, it is to that love that we dedicate our time spent together and we pray that all that is illumined, all that is wise, all that is beautiful and all that is true now prevail within us and dissolve all the rest. And so it is together we say, Amen. <clears throat> Martin Luther King said that any religion that purports to care about the soul of a man but that does not address the social conditions that slam him and the economic conditions that strangle him is a moribund religion awaiting burial. Now, he was speaking specifically about an institutionalized religious doctrine or dogma, but in terms of the spiritual core inside any 
religious teaching, whether institutional or not, exoteric or esoteric, that principle applies. That any spiritual conversation that does not include that which addresses the suffering of other sentient beings is not spiritual at all. There is no serious spiritual or religious path anywhere that gives anyone a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. And that right there, I think, is extremely important. If we're going to talk about mercy, which is pri primary to any deep spirituality, and compassion and generosity, compassion and mercy and generosity don't mean anything unless there's someone that you're being merciful and compassionate and generous to. And the way some people talk today, that only means if I'm being merciful and generous and compassionate towards myself. And although self-love certainly has its place in a deep spiritual conversation, I think it sometimes serves all of us to remember that it's those other sentient beings that form the core of our relationship. Our relationship to other sentient beings forms our relationship to that which is divine. Now, politics matters for that reason. Politics matters because when it goes wrong, people suffer. It is very simple. And when we see the suffering of other sentient beings and we make a stand, spirituality that matters is not just passive. Like Martin Luther King was saying, you know, the spiritual is the yin and the yang. It is both that within us which is still and it is that which in us which knows how to make a stand when a stand needs to be taken. There is the yin and the yang, there is the masculine and the feminine, there is the east and the west. For the most part, the great gift of the east is the ability of, for stillness, and the great gift of the west is the ability and capacity to take a stand and change what needs to be changed. And so what matters in American democracy is not something that is just about external things, some political unfoldment of human history. The reason American democracy matters is not just political. It matters because it has to do with resistance to institutional forms of behavior that make human suffering inevitable. So when American democracy was founded, it was important in terms of the moral development of the human race. It was important because it was a repudiation of an aristocratic system. And an aristocratic system, which had dominated the Western world for centuries, in which a small group of people were deemed entitled. A small group of people were deemed entitled to land, to wealth, to wealth creation, to education, and to any possibility whatsoever of bettering their circumstances. The founding of American democracy as an idea turned the aristocratic principle on its head. It said that all men are created equal and that everyone, that it shouldn't matter if they were born into the aristocracy, that it shouldn't matter who their parents were, that they too should be able to get in the game. They too should be able to own land. They too should be able to have an education. They too should be able to create wealth. They too should be able to have hope for themselves and for their children that life could get better. No country in the world that we know of had ever been founded on that principle. Now we all know the irony. We all get it. We all understand that many of the men who actually risked their lives to sign the documents declaring those principles to be true were themselves slave owners. We get this. This is not like news to anybody. And so we were born of that dichotomy. We were born of that social DNA whereby on one hand, there were established in our founding documents the most enlightened principles that had ever been made fundamental in the founding of any country. And once again, this does not have to do with politics. It has to do with self-actualization. That is the spiritual issue. 
is the ability to self-actualize. That's what the promised land is. That's what enlightenment is. That's what resurrection is, self-actualization, that we could spread our wings and become that which the divine within us intends for us to become. That the acorn has the capacity to become an oak tree. That that which is deemed by nature as the inherent potential is able to be actualized according to one's will in alignment with the divine which is within them. That's why it matters. And the entire American drama has been that we have had these two forces within us because all that a nation is is a collection of people. So nations go through phases and developmental stages just like individuals do because that's all that we are. So that just as an individual, we have our shadow and our light, our spirit and our ego, so does a country. And we have some, some really serious default positions that are shadowy, and we have some serious places where we yearn for light and even actualize it at times. On one hand, we posit the most enlightened principles that ever formed a nation. On the other hand, from the very earliest days of our country, we have transgressed against the the principles on which we purport to stand in some of the most heinous ways. So on one hand, we posit democratic principle. On the other hand, we uh, practice genocide towards the Native American people. We had slavery. Women were not allowed to vote. Then we had institutionalized white, uh, white supremacy even after that and so forth. And that is no different than the shadow work that we do as individuals on a path of consciousness. But with a nation, just like an individual, don't just concentrate on what you did wrong because you didn't do everything wrong. You want to identify the wounds in our nation. And there are some serious wounds. We want to identify the wounds such as slavery and the wounds such as environmental disrespect and irresponsibility and the wounds such as economic despair and inequality and the wounds such as in, in militarism that is outsized. But as Americans, as part of our historic challenge and invitation, we don't want to just name the wounds. We want to identify the wounds. We also want to identify with the healers. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we had slavery, but let me tell you what else we had. We had abolition. Women were not allowed to vote, but we also had the women's suffragette movement. Then there was institutionalized white supremacy, and we had the civil rights movement. And gay people were not allowed to marry, and now they can. And I think it shows disrespect to those who in their day stood up to what was wrong and fixed it rather than bitching and moaning and saying politics doesn't matter anyway. And I believe that that is our challenge today. <clears throat> One of the issues of spirituality sometimes in the higher consciousness movement in the United States, I think, is that we have been too eager to fall for the vulnerable lure, our vulnerability to the notion of relativism. Well, you know, some it's just their truth. Not every, There is a truth. Human cruelty is wrong, and we shouldn't be so sorry to say that. Some things are wrong. And you know, in the, in the conservative side of the American political spectrum, there has traditionally been a concentration on issues of private morality. And traditionally, on the liberal or progressive side of American politics, there has been an, issue, a, a, an emphasis on issues of public morality. War and peace is a moral issue. Economic inequality is a moral issue. Environmental injustice is a moral issue. Criminal injustice is a moral issue. And it used to be there was this thing. It used to exist. It's what used to be called the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy stood for the fact that the political conversation, as Bobby Kennedy called it, was a discussion and a, a contest for the soul of America. But once the corporatists once it became about corporate donations and money in both political parties, the soul was sucked out of the political conversation and there was no longer an institutional reality as in a political party that held aloft that higher conversation. <clears throat> 
There were a lot of reasons for this, and I remind you that the U.S. Constitution does not even mention political parties, and George Washington, in his farewell address, warned us against them. Be that as it may, what has developed is what has developed, and in the last few decades, as they have become more and more about corporate donations, always, for the most part, with one political party, but way too much within another political party, there, has been, there have been too few people, people, people standing up for the fact that we don't have to convince you, we shouldn't have to convince you, that if we do the right thing, it will actually save us money. We need more people in America who say we're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. <clears throat> and because... Because, as a woman, I feel this so strongly, because it's not enough to just talk about the goddess. One aspect of the goddess is the fierce mother. And the fierce mother says, stop right there if that's going to hurt my babies. And it's an issue for women, isn't it? Because we don't want to be deemed strident and we don't want to be deemed angry. But when you see a mama bear or a tiger, or a lioness, and she's fierce because she sees you coming at her cubs. You don't say about the mama bear or the mama lioness, oh, I think she's strident, I think she has anger issues. <laughs> and when we see somebody, a woman who is suffering from, from domestic abuse, we don't tell her to just stay home and forgive the guy. And if we feel that some, we're, somebody that we know is in an abusive an abusive relationship. We don't feel it's unfeminine of us to say you draw that boundary, you draw that line, and you leave that room if you have to. Why should it be any different if it's an abusive president? <laughs> so, so I think that we need to realize about democracy, just as with anything else in our own lives. You don't get to the point with your physical exercise or with your spiritual path that you say, you know what, I like where I am now, I don't have to work it anymore. You always have to work it. And when it comes to democracy, we fell for this idea, we didn't have to work it, other people would work it. Other people would work it. We could just, as long as we drank green juice, as long as we had the spiritual accoutrement going. And the green juice issue and the food issue is an important one, ladies and gentlemen. Because if anything this moment is reminding us is that there is no public issue that is irrelevant to your life. If it is a serious public issue, it will get to your private door. You can drink all the green juice you want. You can go gluten-free. You can be vegan, but if they're poisoning the air, and they're poisoning the earth, and they're poisoning the water, you just might get sick. And so I think that the higher consciousness movement is ready. We're ready to do what in throughout our history has been the legacy of the spiritual movements. Abolition arose from the, from the Quakers. The civil rights movement, many of the leaders of the women's civil, uh, suffragette movement were Quakers. And the civil rights movement was led by a Baptist preacher. Why is this? Because the genuine spiritual visionary has two powers that make them capable of moving mountains. As Martin Luther King said, you have a power within you greater than the power of bullets. It is greater than the power of money. It is greater than the power of technology. It is greater than the power of business. It is greater than the power of government. And that is this, your power to stand up and say no when no needs to be said and to say yes based on your absolute conviction that even if I can't see it, I know there's a God who can and will bring it forth if I will allow him to work through me. And that is what the abolitionists said, and that is what the civil rights workers said, and that is what the women suffragettes said. You know, what was that psychological shift, the bridge that always fascinates me so much? There's a book by Sue Monk Kidd called The Invention of Wings. Have you read it, Deepak? It's a wonderful book about two women called the Grimke sisters who were major abolitionists, but they were actually born in slaveholding homes in a uh, home in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a fascinating story. 
But what that story brought up for me is the psychological shift between being anti-slavery and being abolitionist. Being anti-slavery just means, oh, I think slavery is terrible. Oh, I, I mean, I wouldn't live in one of those states. I think those people are crazy. That did not move the needle at all. Just being anti-slavery, just putting them down, not liking what they did. Being an abolitionist is a shift inside your heart and mind. It's a shift on the exist in the existential ground on which you stand. It wasn't enough to just say, I am quote unquote against slavery. To actually be an abolitionist meant that on my watch, to the best of my ability, this will end. And when you were an abolitionist from a spiritual base, it meant you, you felt in the core of your being that spiritual ecstatic impulse by which nature always seeks to self-actualize life, always seeks the ultimate goal of the enlightenment of the species and the enlightenment of all beings. So that that acorn becomes the oak tree and the embryo becomes the baby and the bud becomes the flower. The same spiritual principle is at work in us. That there is something within us, if we allow it to, that is already programmed by which we will become the highest expression, highest manifestation of what we are capable of on this earth. Free will means that unlike the acorn, we can say no. And in the human body, any cell that forgets to collaborate with other cells to form the healthy functioning, serve the healthy functioning of the organ and organism of which it is part, goes off on its own, goes insane and forgets that it. it's here with everybody else, what do we call that cell? Malignant. And that is what has happened to the human race. The human race has been infected by a malignant consciousness. A malignant consciousness that says, it is all about me. And the healing of this means the awakening, the amazing grace by which we realize, no, it is not all about me. And even though I'm not a slave, others are slaves and I won't stand for it. And even though I'm not oppressed, others are oppressed and I won't stand for it. And even though I am not reaping the rewards and the consequences at this time of the sickness and the cruelty of a cruel criminal justice system, of a cruel environmental policies, of policies that stand for that which hurts those who are less vulnerable than me, I will not stand for it. And in that moment that we reach to that place, we have taken our spiritual journey to a place that it was not before, where it's not just talk. And in order to get to that place, we have to be in the stillness in order to see it, and we have to remain in the stillness in order to practice it. Because everything we do is infused with the consciousness with which we do it. So anger deflects the power, judgment deflects the power. But there's nothing unholy or negative about yelling fire if in fact the house is burning down. So let's be real clear, love always gives a loving response, but sometimes love says no. We know that in the higher consciousness community. We know you gotta set boundaries. We know you have to have standards. We know that we have to be grown up and mature. And we know we need to seek to express love as God would have us. This is not a time, ladies and gentlemen, for this crisis of maturity that we have in this country. And it's not time for the higher consciousness community to give in to this infantilization process, which has had us far too often standing on the periphery while the great issues of economy and, and society and politics have been decided. Quite the opposite, we should be the biggest grown-ups in the room. Because if you know what changes one life, you know what changes the world world. We have been actually, I believe, in a very real way, withholding our gifts, withholding our conversation. When we have a political conversation, it should not be a different conversation than we have. It should be the same conversation that we have among ourselves, but applied in an expanded way to the larger world in which we live. And as we do that, we will make a difference. I remind you that the higher consciousness community impacts because of our numbers and because of our financial leverage, we impact every corner of America that we touch. What about all those yoga mats? Where do you think that came from? What about all that mindfulness stuff? Where do you think that came from? We touch education, there's a new conversation within education. We touch business, there's a new conversation within business. We touch medicine, there's a new conversation within medicine. The only reason there's not a new conversation within politics is because we haven't gone there yet and too many times 
sometimes we're saying, well, I don't want to go there because it's toxic, but it's toxic because we're not there yet. So. <clears throat> So I think that all of us are aware that we are suffering through a period of breakdown in American politics. But I'm reminded of the lyrics in the Star Spangled Banner that through the perilous, perilous fight and through, the, through the, the, the night with the bombs and the red glares, is our flag still there? Well, it's shredded. Star Spangled Banner is still there over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, let me tell you something. We won't be free for long until we become brave about now. And being brave about now means saying things that might not always be popular, but they are the truths of our heart. And I believe we are living at a time which is extraordinary, where more often than you might think, you speak the truth of your heart, and people who might have mocked you before, or made fun of you before, or condescended to you before, won't even be doing that anymore because at the very deepest levels people are just looking around saying what can we do what can we do and each of us in our own heart it is a spiritual principle just as in the body every cell every cell is assigned you go to the bones you go to the heart you go to the lungs in society it is the same way you go into business you go into sciences you go into education you go into whatever it is and each one of our hearts you say this you do that you do that you do this politics is our collective behavioral patterns. I don't know what you're supposed to do, but the reason we meditate and the reason we pray and the reason we grow still is so that we will be reminded who we are and then receive instructions from the divine what we are to do. For those of us who are Americans, for those of us who have in this particular karmic circumstance are inhabiting the bodies and the citizenship of the United States of America. We are called to greatness. We are called to greatness the way the abolitionists were called to greatness. We are called to greatness the way the civil rights workers were called to greatness. We are called to greatness the way the women suffragettes were called to greatness. And I know it's very easy to say, oh no, us? Well, yeah, us. We didn't expect to have a rendezvous with destiny in our generation, but guess what? We do. And on first glance, this is like really bad news that, oh my God, it's us. But if you think about it, it's not bad news. We partied long enough. Actually, we're a little bored by partying so long. Something inside all of us could have sworn we were born for something more important than this. We are. And our time is now. And I think that we are a prodigal son generation. The father was more excited to see the son who left and came back than the one who never left. Okay, so you partied. Okay, so we got it wrong sometimes. Okay, we're not enlightened masters yet. But I don't think all the people who have changed history before us were necessarily, were necessarily enlightened masters yet, but they loved and they were brave and they kicked ass. Let's do that too. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So, first time I went, met uh, Marianne and I heard her speak, uh, you know, she brings the fire out in <laughs> everyone. <laughs> I, I told her she should run for office and I still, and I, and I still think she would be a great president for the United States. So. I, I just want to plant that seed in our collective consciousness right now since so many people are uh, this just just not 250 people here there are lots of people yeah and we want to try that now with the, you might have tried it but the world has to now maybe ready for you okay so what i'd like to do is uh, i like she's marianne's given us a panoramic view of um, american politics and the american movements that have surfaced in the last 100 years ago, uh, 100 years, including uh, the suffragette movement, uh, equal rights, now gay rights, and uh, abolition, all of that. And it's a very wonderful panoramic view. What I'd like to do is, I don't know why, but when you were speaking, I thought I'd want to share a story uh, from my childhood. 
which may or may not be relevant, but we'll find out. So <laughs> this story is when I was seven years of age and we were living in a small town in India. My brother was then four. He is now recently uh, the dean of medical education at Harvard Medical School. My father was a very uh, well-known army doctor, very spiritual. Um, on weekends, he would see patients without a fee. My mother would cook food for all the patients, and they would pray for the patients. And when they left, um, they would make sure that they had enough money for their bus or for their train. So I grew up in that environment. You know, this is spirituality in action. Uh, when we left this little town after five years where my father had a thriving practice, but we were in the, uh, we were army brats, as they say, so moved to the next town. There were 20,000 people on the, in the train station to see us off. And this happened in the next town and the next town because my parents were examples of this amazing spirituality in action, okay? Not for any self-serving reason whatsoever. So when we were um, in this little town one day, the newspapers announced that Mr. Nehru, who was the first pres prime minister of India, he was coming to our little town. Now, for those of you who don't know, Nehru was not only the first prime minister of independent India, but he was the spiritual heir of Mahatma Gandhi, so he had you know, a lot of, lot of respect in the country. So for three weeks in our house, there was only one discussion. What was the color of the sari that my mother would wear for the occasion? <laughs> and my father would tease her about this, but she was quite adamant that she wanted to dress properly for Mr. Nehru's visit. On the day that he came to our town, there, we were on the street at four o'clock in the morning. No one else was there. By seven, there were millions of people on the street. So when I say millions, in India it means millions, okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean thousands or tens of... Hi, Chet, how are you? Good to see you. Thousands, it doesn't mean hundreds of thousands, it means millions. So you, wherever you could see, there was a seeding sea of humanity, people on window ledges, on buses, on each other's shoulders, etc. At nine o'clock, uh, Mr. Nehru's motorcade turned the corner um, before, on the street before our house. He was uh, very simple. He was wearing a Nehru jacket, as we now call it. Uh, he had a rose in his lapel here, which was his uh, trademark. Everybody recognized that rose, always a red rose. And there was a jeep in the front, a jeep in the back. Uh, the motorcade turned um, the corner, uh, went by us, and I swear to God, this is a true story. Suddenly, I s we saw Mr. Nehru turn and look at my mother and take her rose out, and he threw it at her. And the whole crowd gasped. They stepped back, except for my mother, who stepped forward like a queen, picked up the rose, looked at my father and said, Daddy, what did I tell you? <laughs> so uh, then we went home. And she said, let's go home. In that moment, you know, my father wore army medals, World War II hero, all of that. But even at seven, I recognized her as the leader. Okay, so we went home. She emptied one room, and in that room, there was a table like this, a vase, and the rose. And for three weeks, people came to our house to look at the rose. <laughs> and in India, when you, when you go to a house of veneration, you take your shoes off, and uh, you go silent and still, which is what they would do step into this room and they would look at the rose. And the whole house was filled with the presence, silence. After three weeks, uh, the rose started to fade and she had a party and she invited all her friends and everybody got a faded rose petal. So 
uh, you should have seen how they took the rose petal, you know, with the folded hands. They were receiving an emerald, a diamond, something very precious. So we asked our mother what was so special about those rose petals, and she said um, each petal represented the soul of India. So we said, what does that mean? And she said, you know, Mr. Nehru was the spiritual heir of Mahatma Gandhi, and um, he wore this rose, and it represented the dreams of and the longings of India's people who had been subjugated um, by British colonialism for over 200 years. And here was this inner revolution, a spiritual revolution that had brought about independence. And people had dreams, they had longings, they had yearnings. And uh, the leader was the symbolic soul of that deep, longing in the collective consciousness of the country. And so every time they looked at the rose, they thought of the collective soul and what we all wanted as a collective consciousness. So uh, this evening what I'd like to say is that um, there's a deep yearning, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? There's a deep longing, otherwise you wouldn't be here. There's a deep um, desire to create a, a new imagination in our collective consciousness that will lead to a different world. And America, of course, is the microcosm. But everything that you know, Marian said about all the paradoxes and contradictions that we've seen in America in the last 100 years, We've seen that everywhere, right? Uh, it's in the whole world right now. Um, when, whenever you have um, what is perceived as a, uh, what should I say, a demagogic uh, leader, or is perceived as a tyrant leader, or is perceived as, um, as a dictator, or is perceived as somebody who's uh, catering to fear and anxiety, I think we have to recognize that whoever that leader is, it doesn't matter who it is, uh, that leader represents our collective psyche at the moment. Notwithstanding the fact that, uh, you know, okay, so uh, we have a president who lost the popular vote, but marginally so. What's, what's three million in a population of Okay, but still, I mean, there's still almost half a million people, 48% of people, who actually wanted him, right? So in a way, he represents almost 50% of our national psyche, and we have to acknowledge that. And so we have to also see the context in which things like this happen. It's not happening right here, happening in Germany, you know, in, in, in Europe right now in a big way. Um, and everything that we have seen as social injustice, economic injustice, racial injustice, um, ethnocentrism, bigotry, hatred, prejudice, cronyism, uh, corruption, power mongering, influence peddling, it's rampant all over the world. We are a microcosm, this is a lab, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the context in which we have to now dream a new dream, you know? And these dreams only happen when there are crises, unfortunately. When Martin Luther King said, I have a, Junior said, I have a dream, obviously there was a deep, deep longing in the collective imagination of a people that had been treated unjustly for hundreds of years. So it brought that to everyone's awareness. So when, you know, I do a little bit of work with the Congress, I have been teaching meditation there. I know a whole bunch of congressmen who are very supportive of the kind of vision that you are uh, articulating today which is basically spirituality in politics. We already have it, 
uh, in uh, well-being and health now. Uh, it's seeping into our ideas of how we have to take, take care of the environment, how we have, equal, we have to have equal rights for everyone, um, gender equality, all of that is in our consciousness and it's happening. You just said all the things that have happened. So we want to bring spirituality as a practical thing uh, and uh, we have leaders like Marianne, literally I'm not, I'm very serious. If we had a few Marianne's, this would be a different uh, world politic right now in an American politic. So don't, don't take it lightly when we say that we all have a responsibility, but we also then put some responsibility on our leaders like you. But I think we have to look at what's happened in America in the last even since, uh, you know, I've been here since 1970, lived most of my life in the United States. But what, when I start thinking of what has happened is, uh, here are some of the breakdowns that have occurred in America. A breakdown of what Americans thought their identity was. Okay, we are in a bubble here in New York City on the West Coast where you look across and this is an amazing, this is a diversity of people from all over the world. Okay, but middle America is still questioning what's happening to our identity. So there's a breakdown in identity. There's a breakdown in education, which is huge. Uh, we lag behind most uh, countries, even developing countries, in education, um, all areas of education, not just science, but humanities, mathematics, and technology. A breakdown in, um, uh, in um, feeling safe. You know, people, uh, Steve Israel used to tell me, you know, and previously, when people went to movies, they would look at, uh, you know, where's the um, popcorn stand or whatever, and now they look at the exit sign because, you know, we are having uh, these episodes, random acts of violence, whether it's in movie theaters or in a concert hall in Manchester or in a club in uh, Orlando. So a breakdown in the faith that we had, that we live in safe communities. A breakdown in the economic system. People don't trust Wall Street and they don't trust big business. A breakdown in the institutions uh, even religious institutions, a breakdown in our faith on the government and its ability to do uh, things. So, our, whatever the leadership is right now, and I certainly um, was the, one of the most distressed when we saw the elections, if you look at the context and you look at the hierarchy of needs, then we are all coming from a place of fear. And what happens is when we come from a place of fear, we also get totally polarized. You know, so I want to be a liberal Democrat, whatever that means, but people have lost faith in liberal democracy. Because why? Because it takes so much money to get uh, to run a race. It's all about lobbyists. So we have lobbyism, we have cronyism, we have corruption, we have a breakdown in our institutions, we have a breakdown in the, um, uh, you know, I was just looking at statistics, 45% of Americans say that they are struggling in their daily life. Only 20% are engaged in their workplace. Only 20% of people are engaged in their workplace. They don't have faith that they're going to have jobs. Uh, a few years ago, I happened to be in a conversation with President Clinton, and he said, you know, there are lots of jobs, except we are not qualified to fill them. Uh, the, the average person in our country um, doesn't want to do a menial job, a labor job, uh, so we get immigrants, but then they don't like that, that the immigrants are doing the labor, labor jobs, they, but they won't do them. And then the good jobs, the high paying jobs, they don't have the education. They don't have the education in engineering or technology or all that it takes. And Silicon Valley is full of these immigrants, so now we have a policy we're not going to allow them. So, you know, we have a very complex situation. 
spiritual solutions will work only because there is no solution other than a spiritual solution. But spirituality also means for us to collectively at this moment, collectively, I might do this in my meditation every day, I sit quietly and ask myself, who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? What kind of world do I want to live in? What kind of world do I want my children and their children to live in? Am I doing anything to make that world manifest in our collective dream because I'm part of the dream? Um, uh, does my work every day reflect what I want for me, for um, our uh, collective consciousness? So what I'm seeing today is an opportunity for us all to collect ask ourselves what are the deepest longings of our soul and then how can we each of us you know I was distressed yesterday when I saw what happened in Manchester but then I decided to go back on the internet and see did something like that happen a week ago yes did something like that happen two weeks ago yes did something like that happen a month ago yes did anything like that happen a hundred years ago? Yes. Only now we have different capacities for destruction. But we've been like, this is a violent planet with the violent people who have done the same thing over and over again. In fact, every thought that you have right now is a recycled thought for hundreds of years of conditioning. Hundreds of years of, con if not thousands of years. No single thought you have is original. No single thought you have is, unless it's, you know, new E is equal to MC squared or something like that, you know. But otherwise, it's hundreds of years of recycled conditioning. So what do I read in the newspapers today? Okay, Obama condemns the killing in Manchester. Trump condemns the killing in uh, condemn. And they say that these people will have to pay the price for their violence. Nobody's offering a, a, a solution. So what if we keep condemning and saying that we recycle over and over and over again the conditioned mind. And spirituality means to go beyond this conditioned mind, to find a place of creativity, love, compassion, joy, also equanimity and peace. And unless we can bring about this collective reflection right now, we have a global brain here, you know, people, we need to collectively reflect what our vision is. As you said, we need to collectively also use everyone's strengths and complement strengths. We need to collectively, emotionally and spiritually bond in that collective vision. And we need to declare, I declared yesterday, and I've done this before, by the way, and not that I've been 100% successful, but I declare periodically to myself that nothing I will do will have even an iota of violence in my life. Now, how many people are ready to commit to that right now? That not one action, not one word that you utter, not one thought that you have will have violence in it. Imagine what would happen to the world if, say, a billion people did that. But we haven't. We haven't done it for thousands of years. And the only reason now I think we have a fork in the road, uh, a next extinction or a healed planet, is that we have the technology to connect. We have the technology to have Marian speak to millions of people and others like her. We have the technology to feed off each other, express our vision, but unless each one of us is committed totally and unequivocally to personal transformation, there cannot be a social transformation and there will not be a political transformation in the absence of personal transformation. So we want a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, joyful world. The technologies are there. The communication systems are there. Even the will is there. And now is the time. It's now or this is, might be the last fork in the road. Uh, the last extinction uh, was 65 million years ago when a meteorite fell on our planet, wiped out the dinosaurs. Here we are. It was good for us. 
Okay, but now, um, if there's going to be another extinction, it'll be because of the capacity that humans have in the absence of spiritual evolution. Our spiritual evolution has not kept up with our diabolical creativity. Everything we are talking about, climate change, social justice, economic empowerment, education of children, education of women in different parts of the world. People are already beginning. I just came back from Saudi Arabia myself, and um, I saw a women's movement that I've never seen before, which in many ways was even more radical than what I see here, but in, very, in a very quiet, effective, creative way. I met with government of officials in Saudi Arabia, business people, who say, you know, oil dependence is morally wrong because it's going to create uh, climate change. We want to change also. Let us collectively bond to create a new vision. So all I'm going to say is, let's dream together, but let's reflect a little bit. What do we really want for ourselves, for our children, for our communities? What do we want for our businesses? What do we want from our leaders? How are we going to choose those leaders? Because they represent us. Whatever is happening right now in the world, as you said very elegantly, Marianne, we wrote a book together on the shadow our collective shadow is right there. And it's saying, you've been ignoring me, I'm going to embarrass you, okay? And so we are being called to action right now, um, and that action has to be uh, with love, with spirituality, with creativity, with emotional connections and bonding, with reflection and without anger. You can be angry in the moment, but if there's no creative, alternative, rage is rage, even moral outrage is rage, okay? <laughs> Some people justify moral outrage because it's morally right right now to be enraged. But if consciousness is a field where we are all connected and all influenced by it, then even moral outrage will add to the drama of the situation. So let's be creative, let's be loving, let's bond, let's complement each other's strengths. Let us create a vision. We have the technologies, education, entertainment, music, technology. These are our allies. Nobody trusts newspapers anymore. That's another breakdown, right? That we don't uh, trust the media. Right now, So you look at every institution we have, whether it's religion, uh, liberal democracy, uh, the financial institutions, the corporations, um, people have lost faith, even in the media. So who's going to bring back that? It has to be us, otherwise we might as well just shoot the breeze and, you know, go have a drink. <laughs> anyway, sorry for taking so long. Anybody has, uh, we do, Bob, it's so great to see you. Yeah, and you look amazing. I want to be like you when I grow up. So Bob Thurman, everybody knows who Bob Thurman is, right? Yeah, stand up, Bob. Bob has, uh, you know, he's, uh, very close to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, so nothing I've said is new to him, but he has a new book also, and hopefully we'll have a full uh, event here. Oh, thank you, sir. That's lovely. I would love to read it. Yes. So, and as we... Uh, look at this beautiful book. Thank you, Bob. She would be a good president. She would be a good president. Really good president. And I will be her sidekick no matter what. I volunteer to be her sidekick. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we have a little time for anyone to ask questions of Marianne. Um, and if you want to say a word or so afterwards. Uh, let me see if people have questions of Marianne. Yes, yes. And then maybe you can say a word if you want to. No, I'll, I'll, I'll call you. Anyone have questions for Marian? Yes, Jeff. Well, I, 
Okay, thank you. I've known Jet now for almost 30 years. Uh, she's from Denmark, and um, uh, it's nice to see you here. Surprise. Yes, it should be. <laughs> okay, um, I have some questions for you. Wonderful talk. I love it. Um, there's something, you know, which I'm really afraid of in the U.S., and that's why do, didn't you, don't you find the murders of the Kennedy family? I'm going to have to come stand. I can't hear you. I have to hear you. So I have to stand up. You don't have okay. to, I just have to hear you better. I'm sorry. So that's one thing which really uh, frightened me in the U.S. It's about the murder of the Kennedys, of Martin Luther King, and a lot of other good people. Why don't you find the murders? It's very, very scaring that you don't do that because I'm really afraid of that enormous power which is still here in the US who let such things go on without looking for the murders and people seem to accept it. There are several issues there and I want to start with the beginning. Uh, the first question, the reason I say it's the beginning is because it's the most currently applicable. We are aware that in American history in this last several decades, there has been a way that it is simply true. If you have great social and political progressive movements led only by soloists, they can kill the soloist. That is why we need to recognize that this time it must be a choir. They cannot shoot a song. So to that extent, you're absolutely correct. It, this is not a time of the soloist. This is the time of the choir. Uh, we're not the only country uh, that has had leaders assassinated. Absolutely. But we are aware. It's not like Americans aren't aware that this has occurred. I know when I said to Gene Houston, who I think spoke the truth to this, our beloved Gene Houston said it best. Years ago, Gene Houston said to me, Marianne, you absolutely must take this metaphysical information that you have been retrieving and you must apply it to the great social, political, and economic issues of our day. You absolutely must do this. You absolutely must take this information and you must create it as great school of thought that enlightens and illumines American politics. You absolutely must. And I said, I don't know, Gene. Sometimes I think, you know, if I do that, they might kill me. To which she responded, oh, what do you care? <laughs> and I, I think that is the bottom line. I think that is the bottom line. I think that when the Arab Spring occurred and they asked uh, the young Egyptian activists, how did it get all these people into here square? The response I remember was, it was pretty easy. Once you just made it clear, you might die. And they accepted that. And when I said earlier, uh, the land of the brave, I was not kidding. But I know for myself, first of all, that proved kind of messy. Um, the people that were assassinated were turned into martyrs. I think the system prefers character assassination now. They would prefer not to kill you because it actually serves our purposes in a way. But I think it's also true that as The Course in Miracles says, I'm not asking for martyrs, I'm asking for teachers. And I think that when you look, and I feel this very much as an American woman, I think because I ask myself a lot what silences the American woman. Why are we so relatively quiet? Given our extraordinary power, our numbers, Financially, politically, why are we so relatively quiet in front of the fact that 12,000 children starve on this planet every day who don't need to? Why were we so relatively quiet in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq war when so many of us knew in our hearts it was wrong and so forth? And then I think, much like when Deepak was talking a few moments ago about women in Saudi Arabia. Now, if a woman in Saudi Arabia was standing up for feminist principles and she goes too far, be very clear about what could happen to her. We see women all over this world standing up with greater bravery and more courage than us when the worst that's probably going to happen to us is they're going to throw tomatoes at us. 
They're going to embarrass us. They're going to write mean things about us in People magazine compared to the kinds of things that could happen to them. So what I say to myself as an American woman is I don't have to only speak for myself. I have to speak for every woman everywhere in the world who cannot speak for ourselves, themselves. Because I believe that all over the world there are people thinking, what are Americans thinking? And they're thinking, what are American women thinking? But my dream and my vision is that American women become such a moral force that there will come a day when all kinds of horrible things that might otherwise be contemplated on this planet, there are people all over who can say reasonably, we don't have to worry about that, American women will never let that happen. And when your consciousness is in that place, what they might do to you seems so small. I, I got I got something very important right now. When, you know, we may miss it if you don't go back to remind ourselves. The time for martyrs and leaders who were martyred is gone. You know, that history has been there since Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a martyr, Mahatma Gandhi was a martyr, Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln. I can go on and on. I think the time right now is for collective leadership, it's the choir. The choir. It's the choir. And that is what this evening, I hope, is going to initiate. It A collective leadership. There's no one leader anymore. There is a principle in AA, they talk about being as sick as your secrets. And I do think the fact that we're not really clear who killed JFK is a, a, a secret that keeps the psyche of America sick. But there are so many details around all that that are part of the perfect storm of American politics. Any other questions? Good evening. Um, first time getting to see both of you, so I feel very honored and blessed. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just starting to scratch the surface of becoming conscious myself and have a aspiration to impact the lives of others. But I've been, as you've said, someone who's anti um, and doesn't think that I can make a difference on the larger scale. So my question is, what can I do to start from, from where I am, one with my own mind sh mindset shifting that, and then to actually take some action to, to start to impact others and make a difference? In A Course in Miracles, Deepak talked about the prayer that he says every morning in his meditation, the questions that he asks himself. In A Course in Miracles, it's very similar. It says, where would you have me go? What would you, every day we are to say, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to whom? Just as every cell of the body is programmed to go to where it would be of best use and to collaborate with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the whole, as we practice through prayer and meditation, and the effort to align ourselves with spiritual principle. We are drawn to individual wisdom. We are alert to the people that we meet, to the realization where we could be of service. And as we increase and expand in our compassion and know that it is our spiritual commitment to do so, we cannot remain quiet when looking, for instance, at one in three American black men statistically will be in jail. We, we cannot, it becomes impossible to remain quiet. And you place yourself in service. The issue, most of us are asking, what should I do, but from above the neck. And when your entire life is, dear God, use me. When the fire is burning within you, and this is not partial. The problem is, if we go deep enough in our devotion, deep enough into our use me, then it, you will not be called, you will not not be called to the front lines. It will be right in front of you. And your dharma, some people are impassioned, passionate about the environment. That, because that's, a, that's a clue, that's an instruction. You're supposed to be about the environment. Some people are passionate about the, the criminal justice system. That's your assignment. Some people are passionate about getting money out of politics. That's your assignment. 
Some people are passionate about the food revolution. That's your assignment. And I hope all of us will be passionate about the midterms in 2018. Get, get in touch with your deepest, deepest longings for yourself, for your family, for your community, and with the world. And then every day, ask yourself, are the choices I'm making in alignment with those? And soon, life will move you into the answers. Okay, but ask the questions. I just noticed that uh, Nena is here too. Uh, it's lovely to see you, Nena. I don't know if you saw uh, the New York Times last week. There's a beautiful article on their 50 years of marriage. Okay, so uh, Nana's, of course, uh, their parents of Uma Thurman as well. Not that that's how they should be identified, <laughs> but they have contributed to the world in many ways. Um, uh, should we wrap it up? Yeah, Bob, do you want to say something? What a pleasure to, uh, to be here with uh, Marianne. I'm a huge Deepak and Marianne fan, and the idea of seeing you both here together was really something. We, we, we missed you in Washington when she did Sister Giant. She did the, no, we missed you. You were, you were in India or somewhere, probably. No. And, and uh, anyway, I'm a huge fan. So, and we do have to win the elections in 2018 as soon as possible. And we're hoping that uh, Ossoff wins in Georgia and Quist wins in, uh, in Montana and has won a steady string. And, T and Teachout, Zephyr Teachout has to win in my area and get rid of those, uh, those guys. So yeah, it's all very like that. But um, the book I brought you, which is my job nowadays, is, the, is, is a graphic biography of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And in a way, here's someone who didn't get assassinated. <laughs> and who has been struggling against the ch empire of China, uh, who invaded and occupied and annexed and is crushing and, and genociding in Tibet right now. And he still calls for a nonviolent response. And this is to record all of his dealings, Nixon and Kissinger in there, you know, Carter and Brzezinski and Vance, and all kind of, everybody who can't believe it, what he's done, all of, Angela Merkel is his big friend. And thank heaven she survived. And thank heaven the French didn't fall for the Russian Breitbart uh, you know, plot to destroy the European Union. And so we still have the French and Germans in the Union. So it's not all bad. But there, I, the only thing I would like to say, you reminded me, Marianne, in, in the book I wrote earlier before this one, Why the Dalai Lama Matters, um, the publisher of Simon Schuster challenged me to put 10 points of hope and I put the 10 points of hope, and you know, there's too long to list them all. But it ends up with the, the duty of doing this. This has to be a love, nonviolent revolution, which doesn't mean it can't be forceful, which is what you really express beautifully. And Deepak is well known for his saying, peace is the path itself, not just the goal. I believe that's one of your sayings. I know it comes from, it goes, there's a long history. The Indian enlightened people of India have been saying this for a long time, and therefore they're a bit more peaceful, you know, they have sandals, they have, uh, they have yoga. Why did they invent yoga a long time ago, you know? They didn't make it illegal. So, but, but the thing is that at the end of the thing of hope, and the end of the thing of being that is that we have to enjoy when the women of America insist that the uh, stupid men uh, and Deepak and I, in spite of our red pants, excuse me, and red shoes, we have a disadvantage in we are men. And, uh, but we make up for that by supporting the women. And, uh, you know, 50 years of marriage is my, my benefit. She's still surviving, and that shows that I wasn't that bad. <laughs> because we are hard to take care of, you know. But I'm saying, when these women of America, all of you, when you really assert yourselves, and this doesn't mean only in voting. This means with your husband sometimes, probably, who gets some stupid ideas. And this means with your brothers-in-law and, and some weirdo in the family who's uh, like doing some weird gambling somewhere, God knows what, you know. And when they do, 
When they do, they will be happy. And the men will finally be happy. And everywhere where the women are put in a sack, the men are miserable and then they make wars and things, you know. And uh, we can see what we are seeing tragically in, in the, in the, in the, you know, the, Mr. Trump's first experience of public housing, my wife said, which is the White House, <laughs> which, which, which doesn't have golden plumbing fixtures, so he's very discontented there. That's why he goes to Mar-a-Lago and home all, and here all the time, why his wife doesn't want to go there. But my point is, he's very unhappy. He is demonstrating for us extreme unhappiness, and, and therefore he wants power, and he's angry all the time, and the cortisol flow is unbelievable, you know, in that huge sort of orange body, you know. So... <laughs> So, and the, and, the, and the women are shying away from him like this. Well, they haven't asserted themselves enough. You know, you know there's some other things you can grab besides pussies, you know. And uh, he, he needs a little grabbing, he does. And the point is, happiness is the key here. Joy, bliss. So With bliss we win. And the women are ahead. And, and the thing I said, Deepak, in the, in the thing I was quoting, I know I digress, I can't help myself, but the thing I was quoting is, it is our duty to be activists and powerful and loving blissfully, and it is our duty to be so happy that even if they kill us, we'll die happy. That's it. So, I think... I think we can end on this note. We can end on this note because when you get to know His Holiness, not in the same way that Bob knows, but I've had contact with His Holiness periodically over the years, the one thing that is infectious is His joy. His joyfulness makes you joyful. And if we could actually create that pandemic of joy in the world, half our work would be done. So whatever we do, we must do it with joy. Thank you.